Uh, today I'm going to read an interview with Luisa Camacho and her husband, Luis Mendoza. Luisa was the daughter of Rodolfo Camacho Vieira. And this interview was done by my co-author, Hector Garcia Martinez, on the 8th of August in 2001. Before that, I would like to show you something we will talk about in the interview. And this is a label from a 1926 Rodolfo Camacho Vieira. Very unknown label. It shows the medallions that were won at the Barcelona and Rome 1924 expositions of artisans. So Hector starts and he says, we find ourselves in the home of the married couple Mendoza Camacho, Mrs. Luisa Camacho, daughter of the distinguished Uruguayan Argentine Luthier Rodolfo Camacho Vieira, with whom we are going to remember works, savory historical anecdotes about her loved one. Hector says, Mrs. Luisa Camacho, where was your father born in second daily? Uh, when did he begin his artisan work? He began here in Argentina or in Uruguay? Luisa says, my father was born in Uruguay and he began his artisan work here in Argentina. He liked that craft and well, he dedicated himself to it. Hector continues, he says, did he begin by building guitars? According to my understanding, he began in the National Congress making. What work did he do in the National Congress? Luisa says, he did cabinetry works, including the railing of a stairway that is still in the Basilica of Luján in the province of Buenos Aires. Hector says, that fact you gave me is golden. Luisa says, it's still in the church in Luján. I believe that it's on the second floor, not on the first floor where the parishioners come through. It's in the upper part. I believe the railing has been kept there. It's a wooden railing. Hector, is that the only important work he did in cabinetry? Luisa, I believe so because he commented to me about it. He did various jobs. Hector, for example, well, various jobs in the beginning. He worked in one of the largest furniture manufacturers and later he was to be dedicated to Luthery. Hector. How did he arrive at making musical instruments? Was he a musician? Luisa, he played a little guitar. He liked the instrument and he was practicing its construction, studying the methods to make them. He was enjoying it and he was making them with the help of my mother. She was a good collaborator with him. I need to mention that this is from my book, Annotations for the History of the Classical Guitar in Argentina, 1822 to 2000. This is volume four. This uh, compilation of four volumes weighs 21 pounds, nine and a half kilos. Sells for $300, shipping included, worldwide. Hector, did he have a maestro in respect to Luther or did he begin by himself? Luisa Mendoza. Uh, Luis Mendoza, son-in-law. Now, he always commented to us that when the family was together that he was a profound investigator and very studious. He ended the days of his life investigating, studying. I don't remember in those moments that he might have had a maestro. His uncles were from the Canary Islands, Spain. I believe they were great cabinet makers and his father as well. His contact with them allowed him to learn the secret of the high-grade cabinetry. He worked there in the furniture manufacturing plants where they did artisan works for the very wealthy people. He was always inquisitive about Luthery. I believe remotely that he had someone in the beginning that guided him, but sincerely I don't remember those moments. Neither can I affirm it. I tell you that he was a constant investigator and had a great passion for the secrets of Luthery. This starts at page 2561. He continues, 
He had the wood stored for years and years with an admirable constancy. He would grab the top of a guitar or the back. He held it delicately in a position and giving it a little tap made the wood sound, said to the musician, this instrument will give you whatever note. At times the guitarist or violinist continued to doubt. When at times this artist returned from a tour and tried out the instrument and said, look maestro, it's an amazing thing that it gave the phenomenon that you said here. Of course, he worked on various violins, some Stradivarius. He had to open up and repair them. He also worked on some Stradivarius cellos as well. He made notes about everything. The violins he constructed were made with all the technique that had been employed by Stradivari. And after a lot of investigation, he encountered how to dissolve the varnish that he said was made of amber. When he was finishing a violin the day before, he would remove all the dust from the work area to clean and wash the area where he would apply the finish. He did this along with his wife and they would look to see that there wasn't a bit of dust in the workshop. Then he would put on the first coat of varnish, after which he would let it carefully dry and put it in the showcase that was a meter tall and by a half meter wide there laid the violin so it wouldn't get dust on it. He would let it sit two, three, four days up to a week later add a second coat. Then he would leave it for various months and when he considered it dry he gave it a luster with a fine paste with a material he had. After he would string it up, put on the bridge, the sole, as with the cello with the care trying to get the best result possible to come out. It was amazing to watch him work. Hector, how did he derive the making of violins? Did he begin making them, or was it making guitars initially? Uh, Luisa, his daughter. For, no, first he began with guitars. Hector, how did he begin making the violins? Luisa, as my husband said, they brought him violins to fix that he opened up the desire for investigation and there was born the enthusiasm for constructing those instruments. I have a colleague that sold a Camacho Vieira violin for $14,000 a decade ago, maybe further back. I see here photos of distinguished violinists that are photos with dedications. Do you remember what violinists came to Camacho's workshop. There was Henry Swearing. He went with my father and a friend to, uh, of his to one of Henry's concerts. Other violinists I don't remember because so many years have passed. Andres Dalmau as well came to the workshop, though I never met him. Luis Mendoza, the son-in-law. He had violins made by his father-in-law, Dalmau. And it was, and it had given cases where the great guitarists appeared in the workshop of Camacho with great interpreters of the violin and my father-in-law understood there by their prompting that if the guitarists could have an instrument that could, would satisfy their necessities, they also desired that he come to grips with the construction of the violin and would discover its secrets because those musicians needed good instruments as well. On the basis of that, he read a lot and investigated Stradivari. Therefore, he studied and was passionate for the construction of violins that were convincing for the artists. Hector, do you remember the anecdotes he told you about Augustine Barrios? Did he like the Paraguayan very much? Luisa, his daughter. Yes, that Paraguayan, he spent a lot of time in the home and stayed till the late hours of the evening. Barrios was an artist. Apart from being a musician, he was a great poet. And as my father-in-law had written, uh, he had written poetry and had very beautiful verses. That's quoting Luis Mendoza, the son-in-law. Hector, ah, yes. 
My father-in-law had won prizes in poetry contests so that Barrios, he understood well. He got to know the great poets with him. Hector, don't you remember when he met Barrios? Luis Mendoza. No, no, but I believe it must have been around 1920 or 1925, vaguely I remember. Now I'm going to show you clearly of the personality and the noble heart of Augustine Barrios. In one occasion, my father-in-law told me that he was going through some tough times economically, and Augustine Barrios, that was totally kind, totally from the heart, completely noble, without saying a word, he took off a gold ring that he had and gave it to my father-in-law, who didn't want to accept it. Barrios told him, No, brother, I give it to you from the, my heart. If it serves as something to help you resolve your problem, here, it's yours. Barrios was a great person, apart from being a great artist. Hector, did he tell you another anecdote of Barrios' experience that they might have had together? Luis, no, I don't remember so much in detail of that. Well, yes, Barrios told them of his tours and his concerts. They spoke of the goodness of the instrument that went everywhere with him. It could take on any music, classical music of a high level, and that the instrument responded. Here's a picture, here's a sketch of Augustine Barrios. And this was drawn by C.P. Dominguez. And I wrote that the uh, Augustine Barrios from the article written by Segundo N. Contreras in the Revista de la Guitarra, issue number 14, from September of 1946. Though Barrios Camacho got to know many important people, through Barrios Camacho got to know many important people. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Martin Heal, the well-known astronomer, the Paraguayan artist introduced him. Martin Heal had a guitar made by my father-in-law. Did he tell you anything in particular about the personality of Martin Heal? Luis, yes, yes, he shared many moments with him. I have right here an opinion printed on a typewriter by Martin Heal, an opinion about the Camacho guitars. Hector, did he tell you something about Segovia? Luis, yes, yes. My father-in-law commented to us about Segovia that he wasn't an easy person to convince. He didn't waste his time, and he was a, an extremely busy man. I don't remember who it was that introduced him to Segovia, maybe through one of those great personalities with whom he was associated. Surely someone commented to him that here in Argentina there was a great luthier, one of those persons that made the Camacho guitar known to Segovia. When Segovia first heard about him right away, he wanted to get to know my father-in-law. And then they set up an interview at the Hotel Continental where my father-in-law brought one of his guitars. Later when Segovia came during other tours, I don't know if it was in 1934. That was the first time they got together or if it was the second time when they met. It was the second time. He got his first guitar in 1928. It was when Segovia admitted his favorable opinion about the Camacho guitars. Hector, did Segovia visit the Camacho workshop? Luis, no, he never was in the workshop. The encounters were in the hotel where Segovia stayed. I believe I got a photo of him sitting over here. I don't know where it was taken with Segovia and other personalities with him, but among them is Camacho Vieira. Hector, in this moment we will read an opinion of Segovia edited in a label of the Sleuthier. It says, among other things, more or less such, the Camacho Vieira guitar is the best instrument to have passed through my hands. That is what Segovia said. About personalities, works, anecdotes, etc. for example of Martin Heal. He didn't tell you something. He didn't he tell you something? Luis, yes, he told us about the these personalities that he had known and that they had owned instruments made by him. But any anecdote in particular I don't remember, Hector. And yourself you might have met distinguished figures that came to the Camacho Vieira workshop once you knew your father-in-law. Do you remember, aside from Lucio Nunez? 
Luis, the Paraguayan Sila Godoy, the great Sila Godoy, and that other great guitarist of Central America from Luis Camacho, Luisa Camacho, Eduardo Falou as well, Luis Mendoza, the son-in-law. Yes, yes, but no, I was referring to the great artist, I don't remember, the great Hilario Diaz. Hector, you met him? Luis Mendoza, yes, yes. See, si, see. Si. Hector, tell me about him, Luis. Yes, I'll tell you about when he came to the workshop, Hector. What remembrances do you have of Valerio Diaz? Sure. I don't know whom he came with. I don't remember my father-in-law. I laughed. On one occasion, he grabbed a straight edge and he showed Valerio a guitar and a, another one he was constructing. That man was engrossed with the guitar. My father-in-law followed by explaining the technique, the development of the construction, and Alirio Diaz told him, I hear you, I hear you, but let me play a little bit for you. He picked an instrument, and it was an extraordinary thing, extraordinary. I lack the words to tell you what he did. And when he finished, he said, those works can't be played without this guitar. With Lucio Nunez, he saw him. We saw him. He was a technician, very assured, an amazing unfolding. An extraordinary thing, great artist, Delario Diaz. Like others came, Maria Luisa Anito, Irma Heidi Perrazzo, Irma Costanzo, and others. Hector, and what can you tell me about Sila Godoy? Luis Mendoza, the son-in-law. He was in the home of Ernesto Castaneda, with the best guitar my father-in-law could make. That guitar had come from all over Europe on a concert tour that Sila Godoy gave. Then he came back from the tour. My father-in-law had finished another guitar and it was already strung up and he was playing it, but he kept the other one. Lucio Nunez, Ernesto Castaneda, Pablo Anapios all said, for us, that is the best guitar, best guitar that Sila Godoy has had. Sila frequented our home a lot over many years, like he was a part of the family. He was here for hours and hours in our home. He came, he studied, he did everything he had to do, and in our home. He ate, he took coffee. I don't know where he was going. He was attached to my father-in-law, and he played, he played. Later became friends with Lucio Nunez and Pablo Anapios. Dr. Alberto also visited our home quite a bit, and he would come with Sila Godoy, who was a good friend of his. Was Dr. Alberto also Paraguayan? Yes, they were both Paraguayan, said Luisa, the daughter. Luis Mendoza, the son-in-law. I don't know, is Sila Godoy, born in 1921, is, still, is he still alive? Hector, I understand that he's alive. He's about 90 years old, if I'm not mistaken, or close to that age. He would actually be 80 at the time of this interview. How would you define the personality of Sila Godoy? Uh, Sila was actually born on the 4th of December, 1919. He passed away on September 2nd, 2014, due to my note that's added to this interview. Luis Mendoza. I remember Sila as being very focused on what he was doing. He wasn't an outgoing person. He was introverted. He opened up eventually. He was very measured, but in his art, he was one of the greatest guitars given to America. Hector, do you remember the repertoire he had? Was his repertoire more Paraguayan than classical or the inverse of that? Luis. You should know that he played all the works of Barrios, Danza Paraguaya, Las Abejas, etc. He played superbly the music of Villalobos as well. He gave it real life. I think because of Sila, Villalobos became known in the world. Hector or Augustine Barrios. Luis. Villalobos and Barrios, for whom he was passionate, he put the music of Augustine Barrios where it belonged and his music has been played around the world. I believe that Segovia played Hector. It's that I found out that Segovia never played any works of Augustine Barrios. Did you personally maintain dialogues with Hilario Diaz? Did you exchange words? Luis. 
Alario, like so many others, came to the workshop attracted by the guitars, by the art, by the instruments. When he came to our home, my mother-in-law was a great woman making some delicious noodles. I don't know if it was midday when they came. They stayed to dine, passed away many hours, passed many hours. And us, rather than speak with them, we were only listeners to what they conversed about with my father-in-law about the questions of guitars, the violins, the tours they made. We have known great artists. One could vibrate the string up and down to see and hear personalities interpreting on the guitar weekly. When Camacho died the other day, a, a gentleman came. I don't remember his surname. I don't know if he was the carrot, uh, the equivalent of Illyrio Diaz. He came from Venezuela as well because he had seen Hilario Diaz's guitar and he came looking for a guitar. Lucia Nunez had helped him. He located the workshop through him. He played for a long time. There was a guitar that was built for a young lady player in Rosario, province of Santa Fe, that he had already been paid for. And that man had paid some money, some money, and because he couldn't take the guitar, this person was in a bad mood because he said, I had the idea to tour the world with that guitar. Then Lucia Nunez told him, my father-in-law couldn't let that happen. Suppose that this guitar had been made for you and the young lady came looking for it to pay for it to pay Camacho who wouldn't let it be picked up. Finally, he couldn't do it and he left without a Camacho guitar because he learned that the constructor had died. His guitars took two to three months to make, but when he had an order, he didn't make another at the same time. Then there were the times when he would repair an instrument brought to him by some musician. There were almost never guitars in the workshop because they were sold, just like the violins. Hector Garcia Martinez, my co-author, says, individually to you, Luisa, and to you, Luis, I'm going to ask to define the personality of Rodolfo Camacho Vieira, Luisa, and as his daughter, what can I say? My father was a great personality, very affectionate, very good. He loved his family. He was a man of strong character, although with the family he didn't demonstrate it. But he had a strong character. He also loved his friends very much and was true to them. Luis, about his art? Hector, no, about his personality. Luis, look, if you'll permit me to say the history of my father, is very long, I have a blurred image of him. Then what I what I received from them, from my in-laws, I respectfully would say to them, mom and dad, the great man that was Don Rodolfo, I found my true father. What he had for me personally was profound advice for a person that had lived a very intense life. He had a defined concept of things. At times I've commented with my family or someone that this man had learned a whole lot and was a great example. He honored me with his friendship. How did I meet my wife, did you ask? I was with a singer who came to buy a guitar and well, I left marrying his daughter. Everybody laughs. Hector, who was the singer? Luis, Alberto Milan, Milan. We went to many luthiers and I told him I couldn't go on, that I didn't want to move. I had bought a guitar and he could continue looking. He had visited all the luthiers because he knew them, was a friend of theirs. And the last place that we went was there down on Cayo, Calle Oro in the Palermo neighborhood in Buenos Aires. There are obstinate times in life because I was insisting he decided on and buy a guitar and he, I don't know, had some guitar in his hands and said, look, let's go to another shop. And we went to that of Camacho. Do you remember the themes, said Hector, that Elirio Diaz played in the Camacho workshop? Were they Venezuelan themes or classical? Luis, no, Elirio played some of the music of all the classical composers and contemporaries, but he played the work, music of Augustine Barrios a whole lot. He was a fervent admirer of that composer. Hector, I heard that your father-in-law told someone that Augustine Barrios was blocked in Argentina by a representative 
and since then to be able to call attention to and earn a little more money he began to give concerts in disguise of an American aborigine is that true Luis yes my father-in-law told me that it is so Hector do you remember the name of that representative Luis no I don't remember I also remember that he told me one time that on one occasion Augustine Barrios was on tour in another country I believe it was in a nation of Central America he was traveling with the other people in an auto and they were passing over a bridge over above a river a bridge from that epic that collapsed in the as the vehicle tried to pass over it everything fell into the river with the auto people the suitcases the guitar they were able to say that save their lives and the Camacho guitar that Barrios had brought was in the water more or less three hours it was strung up until someone came along and could help them get out of that trance that trench the guitar didn't come apart neither was it broken they got it out of the river they let it dry out Barrios was desperate because he had several engagements he was able to continue giving concerts with that instrument that is what he told my father-in-law when he returned and I wrote in parentheses a similar story is told in the Richard Rico Stover's Six Silver Moonbeams The Life and Times of Augustine Barrios on page 227 the guitar is a Barrios, but the guitar is a 1911 Jose Ramirez in 1915 in Uruguay. It was this guitar that Barrios began his recording career with. End of parentheses. Hector, that was in Central America, I believe. Luis, yes, in Central America, where all lives were saved. I don't know if the chauffeur, chauffeur drove poorly and the vehicle fell into the river and they lost things and I believe they suffered injuries later someone came to rescue them they were able to remove the guitar from the water after being in the river many hours Augustine Barrios was very desperate because he had concerts to give but he was able to rescue the instrument to try it as humanly possible and to continue to play it therefore when he returned he said to Camacho look Rodolfo how noble your instrument is he told him of the qualities of the guitar he had constructed. Hector, as well, I've heard an anecdote about Barrios. They say he was very much in love. And one occasion he was in Buenos Aires, was passing through the streets of, in one of those old horse-drawn carriages that here they call Mateos. And when the tour was finished, he stepped down and left an album containing the forgotten original manuscripts he had been carrying. Luis laughs. It could happen of that. I don't have any knowledge. Hector. Barrios was a very special man. Luis, yes. Yes, Don Rodolfo spoke of him a whole lot. They had spent many years together. He told me that when he would arrive for concerts, Rodolfo had already been advised of the fact. Barrios had sent him letters and told him, I haven't even arrived. And I have to go there. He was almost always visiting him, or Rodolfo would go to the hotel where Barrios was staying. He would give a concert and leave to go onward to another one. But the relations they had were fluid and tight. Hector, in what year did Camacho Vieira come to Argentina? Do you remember? Luis, no, but he came when he was a child. Hector, ah, when he was a child, I had believed that he came when he was grown. Luis, in one occasion after he had been residing here, he went to Uruguay to arrange his immigration papers and he stayed there. He had to do military service. I'm sure it was in the epic when they had the draft, the 20 year olds more or less as was done here. So he stayed there for a while, surely at least a year. He told us that he had an accident while standing guard in the sentry box. I don't know how the accident happened. I believe he fell and hurt himself at the tip of the bayonet. He was ill for a while in the hospital. He had almost slit his throat. Hector, he had won prizes including international distinctions, right? Luis, yes, he was awarded the grand prize in gold medal in Rome, the grand prize of gold in Barcelona, Spain. 
He had also received the grand prize for a guitar he made here in a competition in Buenos Aires. Do you remember anything else? Luis, yes, if you'll permit me to tell you a rich and passionate anecdote. I don't remember if it was one of those known personalities or one of those musicians that we've mentioned that we convinced to take the guitar to Spain for the competition. It appears to be Augustine Barrios or someone at this level they were having made. In one moment of the conversation, he said, look, Rodolfo, I'm going to give you a great surprise. Your guitar in Spain came in 10th position there in the cradle of the construction of guitars. My father-in-law couldn't believe it. They continued conversing. And a while later, he said, well, I'm going to tell you the truth. Your guitar came in seventh position. My father-in-law exclaimed, but you, what a thing. And he told him again, look, to, to end this, I've got to tell you, your guitar came in third place. And lastly, he said the real truth. Your guitar took the grand prize and gold medal. They say that such emotion grabbed Camacho and it produced a childlike man who couldn't stop laughing. He had to go to the doctor because he believed he was going to die. He was even more confused. Hector, what emotion. Luis, he told me the same thing happened when he discovered the dissolution of Amber Varnish, Antonio Stradivari's varnish from this, his inspection of Stradivari violins and cellos that he later applied to, on the violins. That also caused a great emotion and equally the prize he won in Rome. The diploma says to Mr. Rodolfo Camacho in the year 1924 at the International Exposition of Guitar, etc. All those diplomas were in frames. And they were shown in an exposition here. That's all I can say about the great constructor of guitars and person who was my beloved father-in-law, Rodolfo Camacho Vieira, nothing more, Hector. Many thanks to you and your wife. I want to show you again this label of a 1926 Camacho guitar, and it shows the medallions awarded at both the Rome and Barcelona expositions in 1924. This, is, this guitar is dated January 1926. Two and a half years later, Andre Segovia bought his first of two guitars made by Rodolfo Camacho Vieira. I'm going to show you something else. We were just talking about Martin Heal two or three times within the uh, Luisa Camacho and Luis Mendoza interview by Hector Garcia Martinez back in 2001. Martin Heal was an astronomer back in the early days, World War I. There are uh, cartoons of him in my book, uh, quotes of him. He was a music critic as well. And this particular book is uh, from the author Ricardo Munoz uh, to Don Martin Heal. And this is the... 1930 edition of Historia de la Guitarra, printed in Buenos Aires. It was printed in the federal, federal penitentiary because Ricardo was a policeman until he retired. Here we see that Martin Heal had written the... Uh, the introduction to this particular work. He's also quoted, we can see photos. Here's Emilio Pujol with a biography. Emilio Pujol owned two Enrique Garcia guitars. Here's a picture of Targa. So this is a, the first large book, 400 plus pages 424 pages, and it had biographies of current and those that had passed away. It 
Here's a picture of the Targa student, Miguel Yobet. He concertized there in August of 1910, had his Antonio de Torres guitar on stage at Salon La Argentina. He eventually became the teacher to uh, Maria Luisa Nito. Here's a picture, the beginning of a biography of Julio Segueras. There is a uh, video on YouTube I suggest that you watch. Uh, or listen to. He plays an Enrique Garcia guitar on that video. In 1917, he had a piece of sheet music and it advertised the Guitadas Garcias on that. Here's a picture of Antonio Sinopoli. And I have all these bios in my uh, book. I just recently did an interview reading on YouTube of Antonio Sinopoli when he was in Sao Paulo, Brazil, about 1929. Here's other people. Here's Maud Metcalf. She died at a very early age. I think she was 24 years old. She was a great artist, but she contracted a virus or something, passed away. So this had pictures of and bios Here's uh, Irma Heidi Perrazzo. We talked about her. She owned a Camacho guitar. In my book, Annotations for the History of the Classical Guitar in Argentina, 1822 to 2000, is a picture of her with her Camacho guitar. Here's an early picture of Maria Luisa Nito. She had studied with Domingo Pratt. That photo is in my book. I cover her career all the way to her tour of Japan. We show the Japanese language programs that she did. She was quite an international artist. Here's Miguel, uh, excuse me, uh, Mario Rodriguez Arenas. His was the first archive of 12 archives I bought. I spent over $90,000 buying the archives from those that own them. Uh, the money from his archive, which I bought in August of 1999, went to uh, pay for medical uh, care for a grandson. He died in 1949, the year I was born. I'm 73 years old. I love the history of the classical guitar. There's just so much, all these hardworking people. So this is a edition dedicated from Ricardo Munoz to Don Martin Heal, the famous astronomer and music critic. And this is from the Historia de la Guitarra, published in 1930.